Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. It's great to see everybody again. Uh, this is Art Kirsch with my partner, John Coleman, and an unforgettable uh, historian of Hollywood. Uh, what's his name? Oh, Manny Pacheco. <laughs> yes, with a forgettable name. Forgettable That's name. Right. Yeah, really. With really an unforgotten name. Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> Manny, you are you are the premier Hollywood historian. You've got three books, and I think, if, if I'm correct, another on the way, about under the forgotten Hollywood title, mm. forgotten Hollywood, forgotten history. And number three, I love I love the title of number three, Road to Forgotten Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, and there's a reason for that. I wanted to honor with the title the the great road pictures that Bob Hope and Bing Crosby made. Absolutely, they, several of Absolutely. them. Absolutely, yeah. And, and it's, I, I mean, it's obvious. It's a great fun title. Right, and and you know, it also honors that great movie studio as well, Paramount Pictures. So that's why that's why I called it that. Mm. Yeah, but you know what I what I love about all of your books, of course, is that not only uh, do you profile some of Hollywood's famous characters and give us insights about them that you never find anywhere else. But you also cover a lot of my favorite actors, great character actors, people we've seen and learned to love, um, but whose names most people don't know. And one of my favorites in, in book three, in The Road to Forgotten Hollywood, is Key Luke, yes. a <laughs> Chinese American actor. Right. God, he must have appeared in a hundred films, and I'm sure most people don't know his name, but uh, every Charlie Chan film, of course, but he did he did every war movie, every Charlie Chan movie. Great actor, uh, interesting guy, and you just tell us more about him than we'd ever know any, anywhere else. Well, you know, the, the, my, my Forgotten Hollywood book series tries to tell stories about people with familiar faces, but the names might be a generation or two from becoming forgotten. As you mentioned correctly, you, you mentioned the name Key Luke and people would scratch their heads. But you, if you see his face, you automatically remember him, as you mentioned, in the Charlie Chan films. But he did so much more. And, he, and he's a pioneer for the Asiatic communities in that. He uh, had it in his contract because he was born in the United States. He was American. He did not want to be appear with any kind of an accent or any kind of a fortune cookie dialogue. You know, they called it, I guess, a pigeon English kind of way of projecting things because he felt that it was it was kind of a stereotyped thing that wasn't very um, very uh, fair to to uh, those of the Asian culture, and and he succeeded and 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 in in some cases he had bit parts in other cases he actually starred in movies he was in around the world in 80 days in a very quick cameo uh, that he appeared uh and and he, and he kind of makes fun of the whole idea of pigeon english because um phileas fogg tries to speak to him as if he's speaking to a child yes. you you know where we go he goes i speak very well thank you i uh, <laughs> yes. and of course phileas fogg is is uh david niven who plays him you know acts very embarrassed and and so that was that was really key luke's uh, persona he he really pioneered the ability for uh, uh japanese chinese filipino uh vietnamese thai korean to you know to to speak in their native a way of speaking and if it happened to be uh, they were from America they would speak American and and they would and uh, they would sound just fine and others that followed in his path uh, a, a very familiar uh, actor um, the, the gentleman who played Sulu George Takei if you listen to Sulu who also is a character that's born in San Francisco maybe a little homage to Key Luke um, and he speaks in perfect English on Star Trek so that's that's where you get that you don't get the uh, you don't get the hop sing version of of of, uh, of the Asian culture. You actually get a very Americanized, ingrained Americanized uh, language, and and Key Luke is is uh, responsible for that. So I think he's he's a great one to talk about. Yeah, hmm. I've got another favorite uh, in there, and uh, well, the book is how many chapters in the book? About twenty chapters, approximately. Uh, yeah, there's seventeen chapters. Yeah, yeah. almost. And they're they're all terrific, but there's a couple of my favorites. Another one is George Sanders, who was the coolest uh, British actor 
in every movie he ever appeared in. He was just so what erudite and just cool. He just George Sanders. Yeah, George, George Saunders and Gig Young. It, it's, it's probably the saddest chapter I've ever written because basically the chapter talks about how sometimes you sell your soul to the devil and, and the devil wins ultimately and, and bad things happen to the actors ultimately. And I basically uh, uh, keyed in on the idea that uh, sometimes when you're real successful, you still end up committing suicide. And George Saunders was one of the many actors, cool as he was, and I agree with you, I mean... The essence of cool. If, if he's a villain, he's a very suave villain. I'm almost surprised he never played a villain in a James Bond piece because he would have been perfect. Yeah. Uh, and and he was also in the Jungle Book as as uh, as a vil villainous feline, and, and but he appeared in so many things. And sometimes he was very um, he was very majestic, but he always was cool. And I agree with you. But as he got older. Uh, his his sight was going, his mind was going, and so he committed suicide because he was bored of this cesspool we call Earth. And he wrote this very, very snarky uh, 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 suicide note. And it was a very sad way to go for what I considered one of the great character actors of all time. He won an Academy Award, by the way, for his portrayal of Addison DeWitt. What a great name. As the... Um, as the columnist, the very acid penned columnist in the movie All About Eve. Yeah. So yeah, he, he was in so many great movies. The picture of Dorian Gray is another one that comes to mind. Village of the Damned. You yes. know, he's just one yeah. of those great, great actors, but he just despised the notion of getting old and he committed suicide. Of all the, uh, yeah. of, of all the people that uh, you uh, uh, delve into here, uh, wh which one was your favorite woman? Because it seems that most of the more successful actors were actors as opposed to uh, female actors. Uh, who of this group would be, what you would consider to be your, your favorite? Well, I like the chapter that I write about Alsa Lanchester and uh, Charles Lawton. Uh, the two of them were very bohemian actors. They married not for love. They married through convenience, both um, were part of the uh, early, we didn't call it then this, but I will call it now the LGBTQ community. But they, they had a deep and abiding friendship that I guess was love, a, a version of love. And once they were married, they, they stayed together until Charles Lawton's death. But she, of course, iconically was the bride of Frankenstein. I mean, she, those, those photos of her dressed up as the bride are so iconic and they define the rest of her career. She was supposed to be the big actress uh, uh, of the two. She was supposed to be the star of the two, but it just didn't work out that way. Charles Lawton, you know, once he played uh, and won an Academy Award for his part in Henry VIII and then followed it up with Mutiny on the Bounty, there was no stopping Charles Lawton. He became the uh, the real star of the two. And she, as a companion, Elsa Lanchester, she she was dutiful and she worked with him and she made sure that his career flourished, even at the expense of her own career. And she and she was talented. I mean, even later in life, after after uh, he died, she she's marvelous in a in a, 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 a kind of a a spoof on sleuths in a, in a Murder by Death. She's yes. wonderful in that, in that, uh, along with David Niven and uh, Peter Sellers and James Coco and, and Maggie Smith. She she holds her own. She was a she she's one of my favorite actresses, and I was really thrilled to write about her. Mm. Yeah, the um, there's so many, uh, but before we go, I want to touch one actor, who you have in um, Road to Forgotten Hollywood whose name I know only because in college I played, didn't play his part, uh, played in a uh, show called Man Who Came to Dinner. The actor is Monty Woolley, who starred in the movie. It had been a stage play. And what amazes me about Monty Woolley is I had never, ever heard of him other than in that one movie, Man Who Came to Dinner. Yeah. And, and he was famous. And Monty Woolley, it was an interesting thing. He, he was a... Um... He was a director. I mean, he wasn't an actor. He he um, he would would direct, and and he was uh, not. He he ended up in the role, the man who came to dinner on Broadway, 
And Betty Davis went to see the play, and um, the it, it, it name escapes me who Betty Davis saw and then just thought, oh, my gosh, that's a role for me. Uh, and anyway, uh, but she saw herself playing opposite um, John Barrymore in the Monty Woolley part. And wow. um, yeah, and there was a big tug of war as to who was going to play it. And they finally settled on the, the man who, who, who played it in, on Broadway, Monty Woolley. And it didn't hurt that Monty Woolley also would end up becoming uh, nominated for an Academy Award in the Pied Piper of Hamelin. And so Monty Woolley was chosen. Betty Davis was just utterly disappointed and John Barrymore ended up dying within the year I mean he actually I think he died of a broken heart because he didn't get this part playing opposite I don't, I don't think it was a broken heart well, <laughs> well he drank a lot too but but you know but Monty Wolf went on and you know he had a not a long career but he, he was in he appeared in a lot of movies that you might be familiar with. He was in Night and Day he played himself opposite Cary Grant Monty Woolley played Monty Woolley opposite Cary Grant, who, who played Cole Porter, because Cole Porter and Monty Woolley were absolutely close friends. So what better person to play Monty Woolley than Monty Woolley? And he was also in The Bishop's Wife, again, playing opposite Cary Grant. Oh, yeah. In a Same. wonderful role. I mean, yeah. just just a great, great role. Monty Woolley is, it should always be remembered, not for the length of his career, but for the breadth of the of the choices he made in, in in the movies that he appeared in. I mean, just really wonderful standout. And that's why we remember him by face. But you say his name and you're saying, who? Who's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, before before you give everything away, uh, people should go buy the book. I'm sure they can get them at Amazon, okay? Or find, oh, there you go. find it on your website, all the, all the usual suspects. And we'll have them, uh, some links down... Uh, uh, at, uh, in the description uh, of this uh, uh, episode. Uh, but is there any other tease that you would like to give us before they go out and spend their filthy lucre on this wonderful book? <laughs> well, uh, let me just say that I've written three books, uh, Forgotten Hollywood, Forgotten History, uh, a, a, a Son of Forgotten Hollywood, Forgotten History, and Road to Forgotten Hollywood, Forgotten History. It's 56 different character actors who basically share America's story. And uh, my next book, which I believe is going to be called The Adventures of Forgotten Hollywood, Forgotten History, will have another uh, probably 20 actors or so. So you're going to get over 75 actors in my book series. Uh, names that um, you may not know, but the faces you definitely know if you watch black and white movies or you watch TCM. Let me, uh, if I may, I'd like to share one more story, and uh, then we can call it an afternoon. But Arthur Lake is a name that most people, I mention usually when I make appearances uh, and, and speak at events, and they all to a person say, who? Who is Arthur Lake? And Arthur Lake was one of those folks who had a very small uh, movie career, but had a very large life. He was uh, Dagwood Bumstead in the uh, Blondie series. Oh, sure. And everybody knows that face. Oh, Blondie. Oh, my yeah. gosh. I'm off. Yeah, <laughs> he had that very funny voice. But in real life, he married into the, uh, the family of William Randolph Hearst. He was instantly a millionaire the minute he got married. Um, he also was a suspect in the Black Dahlia uh, murder case. Really? Yes, because he happened to meet uh, the, 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 the deceased weeks before uh, she was murdered uh, at, at the Hollywood Canteen. And he also uh, was the gentleman for which uh, he is known best as the um, facilitator in the creation of the most popular sandwich of the 20 and 21st century, the club sandwich. Back in the day, it was called the Dagwood sandwich, yep. named after yep. Dagwood Bumstead. That large, large sandwich that uh, that would have a an olive at the top. And the reason why it became a club sandwich, it, they changed the name, was because Arthur Lake was a member of Rotary, and he would show up at Rotary and they would serve for lunch because every guest speaker gets a lunch. They would just, out of deference to him have the Dad Dagwood sandwich available. And the Dagwood sandwich became so popular at the uh, at the Rotary that they changed the Dagwood sandwich name to the Rotary Club sandwich. And then when they started selling it at places like Coco's, they just dropped the name Rotary and it just became the Club sandwich. 
Hmm. Very interesting. Hmm. Very, this is the kind of tidbits <laughs> that you only get at the forgotten Hollywood books. Yes, and in fact, the whole franchise. I love telling these great stories. And yeah. that's a great homage to a man who had a very small uh, uh, cinematic career. But what a larger-than-life uh, career, a uh, uh, personal life he had. I'm just, yeah. uh, just unbelievable. Well, okay, so yeah. you, so you've given enough away for free, and now it's time. <laughs> now it's time for people to pony up with a couple of bucks, and get your wonderful stories. You're like the golden books of forgotten Hollywood. Okay, because well, it's official. Right, I, it's absolutely official. This is now an infomercial. Right. I, I, I and, get it. <laughs> and and uh, your series of books sit right next to my other series of books that include The Little Engine That Could, okay, and A Taxi That Hurried. So I have a complete set of things that just are wonderful to read. Well, they're available on Amazon, and I'm happy if anybody uh, wants to read my books. I think you'll find the stories engaging. Each chapter is self-contained, so when you finish a chapter, you put it down. You don't have to go back to the previous chapter. You're starting a whole new story. And I, I, will, I so. will say, as uh, unsolicited uh, here, that no matter what you uh, reveal here, there's a ton more in each chapter about all these really incredible people who made Hollywood what Hollywood became and why we all love it. So thank you, Manny. I, I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for allowing me this moment uh, to, to share my forgotten Hollywood franchise. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.